Hey, what's going on, YouTube? This EXO coming at you here inside Little Blue, bright and early. About to head up. Oh, God damn, that's disgusting. <gasps> About to head up the highway to get some groceries because I am freaking starving. Just had a freaking famished burp, if you know what I'm saying. But before we get all that going, I figured we can start today with some good old uh, car audio Q&A right here from the YouTube comment section. So let's go ahead and start things off with Skylar Knapp. He's got a great question here. Hey EXO, what can I do to fix my lights dimming? I've done the big three upgrade and my voltage is fine between 14.1 and 14.5, but my lights dim at high volumes still. Oh boy, buddy there, Skylar Knapp. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but whether you have a thousand watts of base or even 500 watts of base, you're still gonna notice a little bit of dimming on your headlights, especially if you haven't upgraded them. You see halogen light bulbs gradually get brighter as voltage increases and gradually get dimmer as voltage decreases. So if you're having a little bit of voltage drop, you're probably gonna notice that instantaneous drop via the light bulb. It sucks, I know, I deal with it in all of my vehicles. I got high output alternators, extra batteries, and I'm still dealing with the infamous headlight dim. But how can we fix this? There is a way around it to kind of help with this problem, but you need a ballast. You need a set of headlights that run off of a ballast, particularly a set of HID lights because a ballast has a regulated power. Um, it's not gonna fluctuate crazy when that base hits really hard. So at the end of the day, don't let that give you too much of headache because your voltage is still pretty good. It's almost impossible to make a pair of halogen light bulbs completely stable when the base is hitting, especially on punch base. And besides, strobe lighting for the spectators is always kind of funny. And coming up next is probably one of the biggest questions in car audio right now. A lot of people don't understand how all this works. So let's go ahead and try to break it down a little bit for you right now. Thanks to Yukon Jeff and a whole bunch of other people who have asked this question. Tons of people have asked this question. He is asking, a good question I get asked a lot is, what is box rise? How does it affect my system? It might be a good question to touch base on. Well, I think you're freaking right, my man. Now, if I had a nickel for every time someone said box rise is from your subwoofer box moving all around, I'd be a millionaire. It's simply not the case, but that doesn't mean it's too complicated for us to understand. It's really just the natural result of our subwoofer reacting to changes in two different things frequency and pressure, specifically pressure inside the subwoofer box. That's why it's come to be called box rise, even though it affects woofers in every application, despite the fact that it may be in a subwoofer box. But why, what's actually going on in there? Well, let's break it down a little, shall we? Now to start all this, we need to first understand that subwoofers can actually generate power and that anytime our subwoofers are moving, they are indeed creating their own AC voltage. Freaking crazy, right? Our subwoofers can actually back feed voltage into our amplifiers. Who would have fucking thought? You must be wondering what the hell happens to our amplifiers when this new dickhead voltage incides to impede it. Well, it does just that. It impedes it, it impedes the power flow. This right here is where the term impedance comes from. Making a little more sense now, huh? But why should we care? Why does it affect us? Well, that's where ohms start to come in, when we start measuring this behavior and try our best to manage it. You see, voice coils themselves have a constant DC resistance. We've seen this a million times, that infamous dual two ohm or single four ohm rating that we've seen. But the second, the very second we introduce our music, our AC circuit, impedance comes into play, almost always changing things from where they were at rest. And that's just on the amplifying side of things. Our box is gonna play a huge part into box rise as well. I know, I know, it never ends, right? But luckily there is sort of a general rule of thumb here where the bigger the box, the smaller the internal pressure and the smaller the rise. And oppositely, the smaller the box, the bigger the pressure, the bigger the rise. But obviously it's never an exact science and that's kind of what's great about car audio. Box rise is gonna vary from box to box. Even if it's the same woofer and the same amplifier, every box is gonna have different characteristics and have different uh, pressures on that woofer and change the impedance rise. And that's exactly why trying to manage this doesn't really benefit most people. It's way more of an SPL topic, just for the mere testing that it takes alone. You would have to do so much averaging just to make the tiniest bit of difference and what you may gain on that small bit, you may lose on your bandwidth. So really trying to battle your box rise in a musical setup is 
is kind of pointless. So at the end of the day, SBL competitors are really the only people benefiting from combating impedance rise. Because after all, it's always going to be taking place. It's a natural, inevitable result. So I hope that helped explain a little bit of box rise. It gets a lot of, uh, flack in the car audio world for being more complicated than it really is. So I hope this video helped a little bit. All right, next question coming in. We've got Anthony Rushing asking, AXO, do you have a home theater set up in any way? If not, why not? Holy shit, man. Hell yeah, I got a home theater set up. I spent months and months and months planning and designing these towers that are in my room right now. They sound superb. I used all budget drivers, some CIOS drivers in there, all from Parts Express clear out bins. And it's, oh my God, I'm telling you, there was this one Warcraft, the Warcraft trailer. I don't know if you've fucking seen that, but it can blow you away. The bass comes in real good, powerful on the home theater setup. I will link the whole video, 30 minute build video. I call them the Sonopraxis version ones, four 12s, six mids and two tweets. So pretty damn sweet. All right, there you go, Anthony Rushing. Be sure to check out that video, it's fucking awesome. The next question is coming in from John Martinez. It's a really quick one here. I'm just gonna answer as fast as I can. He's wondering, hey bro, I'm putting together a system in a small car. I just picked up an Audiobon A2300 8CQ. What's your opinion um, on this amp? Well, I gotta say, man, I'm not gonna touch base on the, on the uh, magmas because I've never had those before. But I personally have that Audiobon amp in my fucking room right now. It is great. Those things are power horses. They look badass in the process too. I actually took some polish to mine a couple months ago and made it look real, real good and put ever since then a trash bag over it to make sure the dust doesn't get to it. The only thing I don't like about it is that the power terminals are like four gauge. Switch is still fine. It's got enough to carry. So I'm not going to linger on this question too much for you there, John Martinez. But there it is. Uh, that, that, I hope that answers your question for you. I fucking love it. All right. The next question coming in from Eric Belay. I'm not sure how you pronounce that name, but he's asking, hey, EXO, what is the point of having your subs facing inside your box like Frankie versus having them inside an enclosure like the Ion? So he's comparing these two different installs. Obviously, we have four inverted woofers with Frankie and two conventionally mounted woofers in the Ion. Now, why the hell is Frankenstein? Um, have four different why does he have four inverted woofers well when it all comes down to it I couldn't fit um, the 618s any other way with the center slot port like that with a conventional uh, ported box it was really hard without going the fourth order route with you know the 318s on this side and 318s on that side I kind of wanted to stay away from that so that's the only reason why Frankenstein is like that because if you were to flip the motors around there's only five inches of, of mounting space on the inside of the box so those woofers i think stand tall like 11 inches or maybe even 12 inches tall they're pretty stout motherfuckers those uh triple x's so that's the only reason that that the uh frankenstein has inverted woofers and there's really no benefit or anything like that in fact i have a whole video uh, explaining inverted woofers if you want to click it right here I went over I spent you know quite a bit of time going through each and every um, question people may have about inverted woofers and explained you know as best as, as I could at the time so if you want to watch that video it's right here check it out Eric Valet or Belize let's end the video off here with AJ or AJ I'm not sure how you pronounce this one either but uh, they're saying love your vids EXO I'm new to the car audio scene and was wondering if you think components in the front is enough mids and highs to use with loud bass oh man now this is a really hard question to answer because everybody's different but he's asking me what I think you know I personally I think totally man yes you know if you get yourself a nice decent set of components there's no reason why I can't keep up with a good bass system but there also is some gray area there because then there's those crazy cases where you're getting really loud, you know, 150 plus decibels, where you're probably gonna need something a little bit more powerful, something that can take more power. A single set just probably won't do the job, so you're gonna have to buy multiple sets and that can get wicked costly. Those things can be 500, 600 bucks a pop. So if you're gonna buy multiples and have multiple drivers, you're talking 1200, 1800 plus dollars just to have a few of those in your doors. So that's when people go the pro audio route, separating channels, getting the titanium tweets, pro audio six and a halfs or eights and stuff like that. Just drivers that can take more power. But that's my personal opinion. You know, they'll be more than fine, more than fine there. I love component sets, 
but uh, you're gonna have to start getting more of them once you get more base. So there we go, guys. I know that was a mouthful today, but there was a lot of questions that I thought that were really, uh, that could be made a nice video of. So that's why we talked a whole shit ton today. Holy fuck. So I just wanna thank you for watching this video and continue to post your comments below and I'll go through some of the ones that are most popular and I uh, will continue to make these videos, guys. Well, I am fucking starving. I gotta go get some food. I will talk to you guys in the next video. Ha <laughs> ha!